Please stand for the scripture reading. Exodus 29, 1 through 9. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod and the breastpiece, and gird him with a skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Praise be to God. Thank you, Kylie. So much for that. You just read the ordination passage for the priesthood. We're going to spend some time looking at that today, and it actually has quite uh, a wonderful bearing on us. Last week, we spent a few moments looking at the funding, the furniture, and the fixtures of the tabernacle and how they pointed to Christ. I warned you about focusing too deeply on the Jewish elements of the details to the point that they cause you to miss seeing Jesus. Have you ever had that happen when you're studying Scripture? We, I used that illustration last week. It happens to me more times than I care to admit. You walk into a room, you forget why you're there. You can get into a text sometime in the Old Testament. I'm looking at some Bible studying scholars in the room this morning, some BSF folks. And, man, you can study something sideways to Sunday, and you get in there, and you're like, wait, what are we talking about? <laughs> you get all caught up in a verb tense and this and that and uh, you know, the, the commentators will fill up books, volumes of books, over things that can sometimes distract us from seeing Jesus. If we focus too much on these types of details, it could easily feel like last week and this week are episodes for some Bible version of HGTV, like this old tabernacle, and this week, I don't know, instead of a yes to the dress, maybe a nod for the ephod. I'm not sure what what to do with that, but that's not where we're going, okay? There's symbolism, rich symbolism in all of the threads and every single piece of material. God was specific, and when God is specific, He is specific for a reason. And you will enjoy reading that this week, Exodus 28 through 31, and then picking up the instrument or the implementation of that in 39. You'll enjoy reading that this week. Wink. You see what I did there? Because you guys, okay, awesome. What I'm going to focus on are two main elements that will surface pretty easily. We're not going to ignore the details, but we're not going to go too deeply into them. The Lord is now instructing Moses. Remember, all this is happening on the mountaintop, right? They didn't cover this in the Ten Commandments movie. I don't remember Charlton Heston getting all this. He went up there and lightning struck some stones, and then he went down, and his, uh, those broad shoulders came down the mountain, and he got mad and threw it at him, and lightning... Is, am I the only one that's seen the movie? Okay. It's not what I based the sermon on. It's okay, I promise. But, but I don't remember this, right? When, when Charlton went up to the mountain, it was just about the Ten Commandments. But remember, that was this much of what happened. He was up there for 40 days. And most of it was the construction of the tabernacle, the implementation of the priesthood, and for the people of God to learn how to worship the God of the people. So, He's up there, and now the Lord is instructing him about the priesthood that was going to preside over the nation's religious life. Take your Bibles and turn to Exodus 28. We just read from 29. We're going to back up and read just a little bit from 28. It's a portrayal of the ideal high priest, a foreshadowing of a type of Christ, but it also contains references to Aaron's son. So we've got two priest offices being described here. We've got the high priest and then the rest of the priests, okay? Now, the high priest, Aaron, would be described, and then his sons for the priesthood. 
priests would minister in the tabernacle in a number of ways. They would burn incense on the golden altar twice a day. They would maintain the lampstand and its oil. They would take care of the bread. Lauren, none today? Okay. They would take care of the bread and the bread of presence and the table that it was on. They would offer sacrifices on the altar of burnt offering, including taking care of the altar itself. They were to bless the people. Now, those were the essential duties of the priest, but how many of you have worked in the corporate world and you have essential duties? I know one fellow in the room that this is in every job description at that not particular nonprofit, which shall remain nameless. And it says, and other duties as assigned. Anybody ringing a bell? Okay, yeah. How many of you ever felt like your job was just other duties as assigned? Happy Mother's Day, right? Um, here we go. Here's some of the other duties that priests would find themselves doing. They would preside over civil cases They would instruct people in the law. They would give encouragement in times of war. That's where the priests were headed, but this is where they got started. And it started with what they wore and how they got into the tabernacle to perform the duties that they were going to perform. In Exodus 28, 1 through 3, look at your Bibles. The Word of God says, God's telling Moses, Bring Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. If you're inclined to mark in your Bible, I would take a pen out and circle or underline that word, me, to serve me as priests. Not to serve the church as priests or to serve themselves as priests, but to serve me. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. And you shall speak to all the skillful whom I've filled with a spirit of skill. And they shall make Aaron's garments to consecrate him. Watch it again. For my priesthood. Do you see it? Lovely. Chapter 28 then describes the clothes that the priest is to wear. It's very much like a uniform. Now, imagine with me just a moment, you're going to be pedestrian and walk in South End to go get lunch for Mother's Day after church today. You're going to walk to a restaurant nearby, and as you're about to cross the road, somebody yells, stop, stop right there. As you turn around, if you were to see a uniformed police officer, that would have a great impact on how you responded, right? You're like, oh, he knows something I doesn't, she sees something I can't. They have a position of authority. There's a reason they're telling me to stop, and we would do that. That uniform that they wear is a sign of authority vested in them by the state. And similar, the priest's robes were not just somebody to go like, oh, look what you're wearing today. No, it wasn't for that. It was their uniform to show God's authority being vested in them. It's a sign that they're acting as priests. But there's more going on to that. They're so symbolic. There are seven elements I want us to look at today. That one may be a little light. Here's one on the other side of the screen. I believe you have this even on the feed for just a moment as I describe them. Let's take a look at them. Yes, I have the undergarments mentioned. Believe it or not, I'm going to spend a moment talking about the priests. Undergarments. You're going to leave today and your friends are going to go like, oh, how was the Mother's Day message? And you're going to say, well, our pastor talked about the priest's undergarments. Moving on. Uh, there's undergarments. There's a white inner robe. There's a blue robe over that that has bells and pomegranates on them. There's the uh, ephod or ephod. It's pronounced a couple of different ways. A uh, sleeveless garment of gold and blue and purple and scarlet. You see it there. It's held together by a jeweled clasp on each shoulder. There's a girdle or a belt around the waist. A jeweled breastplate held in place on the ephod by golden chains attached to the shoulder clasps. And then there's that turban with a golden plate under it. Interesting to note that plate right underneath there. You can barely see it on the image, but it says, Holy to the Lord. I want to highlight two of the pieces there. I want to mention, I do really, the undergarments and the breastplate. Here's why. Um, In Exodus 28, verses 42 and 43, they're talked about. Now, the, the middle schooler in me is... Kind of giggling a little bit at that. I get it, right? All the kids are like, (laughs) but but here's the deal. It was very odd to us to read that this is listed. It, It seems like a throwaway detail, but for the Israelites, it immediately contrasted their priests, watch this, 
from all of the pagan priests around them. It immediately made a distinction of their high priest and the rites and ceremonies that they were going to do versus the nations that they would encounter. Since we're gathered this morning in various generations and there are little ears among us, let me just say it this way. The worship and sacrifices given to pagan gods by their priests were salacious. And done without garments of any kind. So this was really different. That they wouldn't just have a robe, but that God would be concerned with the purity of a white linen garnet touching up against their skin. Alec Montyer writes, So it was that the high priest possessed inwardly, underneath the garments where no one could see, still the beauty and the purity of holiness. The earthly priest was to be pure and set apart. Now, we know your mind is already there that Jesus was the perfect picture of this because it wasn't about what he wore. He was pure and set apart. There was no need for him to offer sacrifices for his own sins. He knew no sin. If you can hang with me for just a moment on this beautiful quote, Campbell Morgan's memorable words. He's speaking of the ascension, but this speaks to the purity of Christ. Listen to what he says. He, Jesus, was the first man to enter into the perfect light of heaven in the right of his own holiness. Heaven had never before received such a man. On that ascension day, there came into heaven a man who asked for no mercy. Wow. Pure, spotless, victorious. Christ came into the light of heaven and caused no shadow. Wow. So you see why they're worth mentioning. It's a distinction. And now I'm going to throw the breastplate on the screen so you can see that. It's a pretty remarkable piece. In verse 15 and 16, it talks about this skilled worker making this and the style that it's to be made. It's going to be square and doubled, a span of its length and its breadth. Verse 21, there'll be 12 stones with the names of the tribes of Israel all on there, the sons of Israel. There'll be signets around each one engraved with its name. This piece is tied to the front of the priest over the ephod. Sewn into it are the 12 precious stones in four rows for the 12 sons of Israel. So here's the picture. You see those things on his shoulder too? Those are stones on his shoulder. Also engraved on there, six on one side and six on the other are the names of Israel and the tribes. You're going, what's the big deal? Think about it. When he enters, when the priest enters into the Holy of Holies, he's got Israel on his shoulders. He is carrying the weight of the people on his shoulders as he enters, and they're on his heart. Now, I'm going to try to get to the Jesus connection without crying and turning into a puddle of tears up here, but I want you to picture that for just a moment. The people of Israel on this broken, sinful priest, they're on his shoulders, on his mind, and they're on his heart as he enters in. Wow. We'll come back to that at the end of the message this morning. Do you see that little, I don't know what that is. It looks like a little folder, a little folded up something sticking out of that breastplate. That's not a post-it note so he can remember to pick up the dry cleaning because he forgot something or a, oh yeah, I meant to do that. That's this interesting thing. Uh, It's how the Lord directed the priest in matters of great decision that had to be done. It's a reference probably to the Urim and the Thummim. Say that fast. Uh, These are two things. They're mentioned only a couple times in Scripture. Interesting things. We think they were colored rocks of some kind. And the priests, when they needed direction from the Lord, they would pray a certain way after they had consulted the scrolls and thought, you know what? We we can't find a direct answer in the Word of God, so what we're going to do is is ask the Lord to lead us, and whatever rock they pulled out was the answer from God. Now, they believed God would speak and lead them to that, and God honored that in some way. I'm just going to tell you, it's kind of weird. I mean, it just is, right? That's strange. That's on this side of history. God doesn't need you to go by colored rocks today. That is not the application of the sermon. pastor said we start throwing dice to determine the will of God. No, he did not. Sinclair Ferguson writes this and says, God's will, knowing God's will, comes through a combination of the study of God's word and a heart which is submitted to the Lord in the word 
and the help the Spirit gives to illuminate the Word. So we don't have to go that way. Remember, they're in Exodus, early stages of this, right? We're on this side with the complete revealed Word of God. Can I tell you something? Every major life decision that Ashley and I have made in the last 15 plus years of our marriage, we've been married for 20, we didn't make them all correctly, but we covenanted early on to follow along with our daily reading. And when we had a major life decision, we didn't go to the back of our Bibles and look in the concordance and try to find the answer. Because guess what? Your Pastor Darren, Phil, Norm, Scott, Jim, all of us will tell you the same thing. If you start in the concordance, you can make this thing say anything you want it to say. It'll say go if you want to go. It'll say stay if you want to stay. I don't want to leave. Show me all the verses on stay. Well, God's word said stay. No, here's what I found to be more helpful. Your daily disciplined reading of the word of God. God knows where you're going to be, when you're going to be there, and he speaks through his word. God speaks through his word. We don't have to have a breastplate tucked in with a post-it note to pull out this weird thing to try to discern what God's will is. He's told us, he leads us, and he guides us. Simple quote, When you are uncertain about what to do, you should pray that the Spirit would use the Word to show you the way. Ask God's Spirit to use the Word to show you the way. That's that's all I want to speak about, about the attire of the priest. You can go and read it. It's pretty interesting reading. I will say this. Now we've got them clothed in 28, but there's still sinful men that need to get into the Holy of Holies. Chapter 29 covers how they're cleansed and the sacrifices that need to be made. Listen to this very quickly as we hasten to application this morning. They were first washed from head to toe, symbolizing spiritual cleansing. Then they were clothed with the garments mentioned in chapter 28. Then they were ready to be ordained. There was an anointing oil poured on their heads to flow down their whole bodies, showing that they were set apart for ministry. Then a bull and two rams were sacrificed. Blood from the bull and two rams. Now we're trying to be sanitary, right? Picture this. Blood from the bull and two rams was put on their right earlobe, right thumb, and right big toe. And then there was a meal of one of the other sacrifices. They did that every day for seven days. Every day for seven days. And then, once ordained, they would enter into the temple where the Bible says they would make sacrifices to God every day as an act of worship. Now, coming up in about a month, we're going to install a deacon uh, at Grace Covenant Church, but um, it will not look like that. Just a words, heads up there. I'm not going to be uh, putting blood on anybody's ear or thumb or anything like that. So don't, don't worry. It's not going to be quite like that. But that's a lot, isn't it? That's very detailed and in, involved. And that's just skimming the surface. That's a very high-level summary of what it takes. But look, here's the point. They were unclean, and they needed to be made ceremonial clean so they could go in and offer the sacrifice that the Lord had prescribed for them to do. There are the details. Of all the lines that we could follow in this this morning, I want to follow two things. I want us to see our high priest and the priesthood this morning. Maybe you've jotted down a few notes already. Here are two main notes. They each have four little subpoints that tells you how to make your note page right. That's why I do that for you. Number one, Jesus, not Aaron. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our high priest. We noted earlier that God is showing Moses that Aaron will function as the high priest, and there'll be quite a bit of distinction in his role as he stands before the Lord. He, he's a heavenly man. He's going to represent God's wisdom. He stands before God on behalf of the people. He stands before the people on behalf of God. He's responsible as mediator. But I just got to tell you, he still had to have sacrifice made for his sins on a regular basis. Remember that design that we showed earlier of the priest's robe and those pomegranates on the bottom? There were also bells on there. The bells would announce his entry into the Holy of Holies, not because God was sleeping and needed to know that he was ringing the doorbell. That's not what that was, right? This was not his little doorbell and the video thing popped on God's iPhone and God's like, who who is it? It's not what was happening. God knew exactly what was going on. The priest is entering this. It's really an announcement to the people that something holy has taken place. Here's what else it was. 
just in case the priest later on had entered there with unconfessed sin that had not been covered by the blood. Do you know what happened to him in God's presence? He dropped dead. And when the bells stopped ringing, the people, there was a rope attached to his ankle. They would pull, and they would pull the dead high priest out, knowing that no sin can be tolerated in God's presence. Jesus is our high priest, and he's superior in so many ways. First of all, he's superior in his holiness. No bells on his robe. None needed. The problem facing these priests is that they were sinners, and all the sacrifices and wearing all the right garments still wasn't enough. The Old Testament priests were imperfect, but Jesus Christ never failed. He never sinned. He was not clothed with beautiful garments but with perfect holiness. Jesus was clothed with glory and honor. He did not need to offer sacrifice for himself. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 7, he was and is the spotless, holy Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. Jesus was superior in his holiness. That's why he's our high priest. Jesus is superior in his anointing. He too was anointed for his priestly ministry. His baptism was a part of his ordination. You remember it. John describes it. It's described in the Gospels. Instead of oil symbolizing the Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself, the Bible says, descends from heaven and rests on Jesus. The Father speaks and says, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Luke would tell us in Acts 10, God's anointing of Jesus of Nazareth happened with the Holy Spirit and with power. That's a better anointing than olive oil, even of the purest kind. Jesus is superior in his holiness. He's superior in his anointing. And he is superior this morning in his representation. The high priest stood in the place of Israel before God. I told you that every Israelite understood that he represented him or her. The priests carried their names on their shoulders, remember, and on their hearts. But instead of stones on his shoulders, Jesus carried the cross on his shoulders. He carried us on his shoulders, bearing our judgment, our sin in our place. He carried our names, not on a breast piece, but on his heart, for we are in Christ. We died with him. We were raised with him, and we are united in him. Isaiah says our names are engraved on his hand in chapter 49. Further, our representative provided a better sacrifice. He did not sacrifice animals, but himself. Here's the good news for us today. The Father now sees us because of our representative, as being in Christ. He accepts this great high priest, the better priest, work. And if you're in Christ this morning, you are accepted just as much as Christ is before the Father. What a priest. No earthly priest could do that. Fourth thing, why Jesus is superior. There are so many other reasons to list. I'm just giving you four. It's Mother's Day. He's superior in his intercession. Superior. He's holier, yes, he has a better anointing, yes. He's our better representative, yes. That breast piece, though, was a reminder that the priest interceded for the people. That means he stood in the place of them praying for them. As he took the items and time to make decisions, it was a reminder that he carried their concerns to God. Jesus, the Bible says, continues to carry our concerns on his heart. One of the things he's doing now is functioning as our inter. Cesar and his priesthood is permanent. In Hebrews 7.25, the Bible says he always lives to make intercession for us. Wow. Jesus is better. Even with all the pomp and circumstance and beauty of this Old Testament high priest, Jesus is better. He's superior in holiness, in his anointing, in his representation, in his intercession, just to name a few. He's all you need. He's all you could ever hope for as a mediator between you and the Father. My question to you this morning is, is he your high priest? Aaron can't hold the office, and neither can your mama or your daddy. 
My kids can't depend on me to be their high priest, to stand before them on their behalf before God. They won't have access into heaven because their daddy was a preacher or a pastor or an elder or a church member or faithfully followed the Lord. Neither will you. You may have godly parents. We celebrate godly mothers today, but that's not enough. Your mama's not your high priest. Your good works are not your high priest. Your religious affiliation is not your high priest. Your intellectual assent is not your high priest. Christ alone can forgive your sins. Christ alone can make you new. Christ alone can help you stand before the Father. Now, the point in what we're saying is this, Hebrews 8 We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent, that word is tabernacle, that the Lord set up, not man. And since Christ is our high priest, guess what? We are now the royal priesthood. Four quick thoughts on this and we're done. We're the royal priesthood. There's several things we learned about those high priests. Let me recap them for you, then I'll slip them into application. Here they are. The priests were chosen to serve God. We saw that in the text. The priests were chosen to serve the people. All of them were. They dealt with all those goings on in the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies. The priests were set apart to God, for God, by God. We saw that with what they wore, even their uniforms and what they wore and how they conducted themselves. And the priest had to, must minister daily. Wow. But the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2 and 9 that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You see, you took those notes away too quick. Don't worry. Here they are now as application. As his royal priests, are you ready? We have been chosen to serve God. One country pastor's wife that I love deeply, she's in heaven now, she made this statement, you've been ruined for Jesus. Only a handful of you know what ruined means. That's not Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic. It's Southern. God has ruined you in the best possible way to serve the Lord. We have been chosen by God to serve others. It's our privilege. It's not that we have to, it's that we get to. <laughs> We have been set apart for God, the Bible says. We're His own possession. We are proclaiming His excellencies. We abstain from the passions of the flesh. If you go back to that passage in Peter there, which wage war against us, we keep our conduct honorable among others. And finally, we get to do it every single day. He makes His mercies new every morning for us. We die daily to self and come alive daily to our role. Now, the Bible says, you are God's people. Now you've received mercy. Now we live as people who are free, living as servants of God. Whether or not your mom serves God and serves others and has been set apart for God or ministered daily, whatever your relationship with your mother was, this is not a Mother's Day sermon. I'm inviting you to see Jesus as the high priest. I'm inviting you to step into your role as a royal priest because of Christ alone. You and I have the incredible privilege of serving him and others and being set apart each and every day. Not as a ritual, not to prove anything or to earn anything from God. No, no. But with a mind filled with his word and a heart full of love for him, and a life that is animated by his spirit. Do you feel priestly this morning? Do you feel like a priest this morning? Well, you say, no, I I don't. Um, uh, I don't like the question. Well, some of us don't feel human when we wake up in the morning. Can I get an amen on that? Sunday morning sometimes comes calling even early on your pastor. Some of us don't look too human when we wake up in the morning either, but we're, we still are. Don't let your feelings rob you of truth. You may not feel like a priest as a part of the royal priesthood. Please don't go try to recreate the priest garments and show up in them next Sunday. That's not, I'm not interested in that. Thank you so much for that. 
But regardless of what you wear or how you're feeling this morning, you still are if you're in Christ. We are the kingdom of priests, not for religious rites or ceremonies, but to serve God, to serve others, to be set apart for his glory. And we get to do it every single day. Would you stand with me this morning as we pray? The musicians are coming now as we prepare our hearts for worship. I wonder today, what do you have before the throne of God above, thinking it's enough to represent you and to, to get you into heaven? We say it sometimes when we're sharing the gospel evangelistically this way. We say, if, if you were to die right now and, and you were to stand before God and he asked the question, why would I let you into heaven? What would you say? Here's the right answer. You ready? It sounds something like this. Christ alone. Now, it's nuanced. There are a lot of things from that. But Jesus Christ is the only hope that I have that my kids have, not me, that you have, that your kids have, to bring glory and honor to this God who loves us so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, to make it possible. Father, we love you this morning. I pray that our love for you would just overflow as we sing songs and knit our hearts together. And some of us even do business with you today. Lord, if there's some among us that are depending on anything other than you as their high priest, if there's some among us who are uh, kind of resisting that role that you've given us, the world is watching us and we are a representative of you, whether we feel like it or not. Fill us with your Holy Spirit today, that the fruit of the Spirit might be what dominates our output, God. Not because we want to prove anything or earn anything, Lord, but because we want to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength that you've made possible in Christ. Forgive us, cleanse us, use us, spend us. In Jesus' name. And the church.